uh, I'm going to tell you about the Steel Doors mural project. And all this stuff back in the 1989-90, so all this stuff's a little fuzzy, but I can give you most of the details. So, um, uh, in 1990, I was doing a group of murals along the boardwalk on uh, buildings owned by Warner Sharp. And in the process of working on the street, I got to meet a lot of the local artists and graffiti artists and everyone else in the community. And uh, at a certain point, I realized that, uh, uh, oh, second, I was also involved with a, uh, a local civic group called the Venice Action Committee that would um, meet every Tuesday at the sidewalk, at the sidewalk. Uh, and. Uh, and they did their projects and they were like an information source for me and because I was doing the murals, I was, you know, a guest there and all worked well. And uh, so I came up with this idea that I could uh, have the, some of the graffiti writers that I was meeting during the day uh, put up a mural artwork on their steel roll-up doors all on the front of the uh, boardwalk. And they had the connection for getting the rights of the, the roll-up doors from the owners and uh, funded the Kansas spray paint. And I would uh, go out at night. This is a very low-key kind of uh, effort. I mean, you know, there's only really me. And uh, the idea was to uh, let these uh, mostly young people uh, come in and have a chance to do something that instead of being illegal on the wall was something they could present to the public and kind of help them get through the trickster stage blah 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 so uh, and it sort of worked really well in that regard you could kind of feel it and sense it uh, but there's a lot of stories uh, first place and all of this was kind of dangerous this was not you know you know, a model for a public program or something. This was a little crazy. Uh, at night in Venice in 1990, not like it is today. Uh, everything, the steel roll-up doors came down. Uh, it was dark. Nothing was open. Occasional bar, you know, a couple around up over here. And sometimes I'd have one one group or a guy, and other times I'd have three or four groups, and uh, they'd bring their own little tips. I'd just bring a lot of cans, you know, crates of spray paint, maybe three crates, and uh, and. Uh, on one side would be cops wanting to know what we were doing, and I, I was there to, you know, here we go, everything's good. And uh, on the other side, you have roaming uh, street gangs coming through at night. And those were very dangerous. Uh, they would all sort of uh, kind of walk through. We'd all kind of stand around, and they'd pick up spray cans and do a little of this and that, and then move on and leave us alone. Happened two or three times. Happened to me individually, also at night, and uh, I came out unscathed all the way through it, so it was, none of that was an issue. But it was it kind of set the precedent for what was going on there, and um, the work. Some of it was really good, some of it not so good. This was uh, in the historical setting. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, graffiti started art started back in the late 60s in New York and subway trains kind of grew from there and I had very little knowledge of the history of it but it was still in its early stages in the 1989-90 and uh, so there was a lot of different people there. Uh, there were um, occasional hippies, uh, a lot of uh, uh, hardcore types and, uh, and uh, the shocking thing, I think, was that more than any other group, they were uh, sort of middle-class white kids that struck me as being both the, 
kids with gumption that were smart and talented. Uh, and, and this was could be important to them as a way to kind of let them see their way into being productive and blah blah blah. Okay, so um, I wanted to tell you. So the project worked really well. Uh, I think we did about. I did three different projects. One of them nine walls, and that was way down better than the end of the boardwalk. And uh, I would, so they would come out while I was painting, and then I took the project grew as it went along. And um, there's a couple, couple of stories that are fun to tell. Not, well, not fun, really. Uh, one is uh, the in the middle of it, uh, kind of the at the same time this was going on, I had painted a picture of. Uh, a nine foot tall picture of a cop kind of going like this right and I did that uh, on the corner of an alley where uh, uh, during the busy time people would go and pee so it was a kind of a way to you know you walk over there and you're about to pee you look up and go oh my god so it was you know it was fun I did that all but I knew that picture was going to get graffiti right so uh that piece uh, was up for three or four months, got hit off and on, and I'd go back and repair it. And then this guy came along, his name was uh, Jesso. And Jesso uh, did a really good job when he repeated it. And I, I say that because during that same period, I was painting paintings where I would go back and graffiti them as, as the finished product. So that one hit just right, right? So I left that up. And this was going on at the same time as the Steel Doors project was. So I put it out there that I wanted uh, Jesso to do one of the walls. So uh, he did. Uh, so the story on Jesso was. Uh, it wasn't just cops and gangs we had to worry about. We had to worry about all the other graffiti writers because this guy's M.O. was he graffitied other people's art, right? So that's what he did to mine. <coughs> so, uh, so, uh, uh, so when he was out here doing it, he didn't want me to know that I, I, he was the guy that had graffiti my art, but of course I knew. Uh, but my job that night was basically to guard him from other graffiti writers who wanted to kick his ass. And he put up his piece and that's the end of that one. And that whole young in idea, I was hoping, wow, maybe I had an impact on this guy, but no, I did not. Apparently a year later he died down in LA because he was, his personality wasn't gonna fit in that real, I guess. Uh, oh yeah, and then the end of the project is uh, uh, I couple this this grew so I had a wide variety of different people coming out and doing these things. They start at nine o'clock at night after everything closed and got dark. And we'd go on to like twelve or one o'clock and then we'd wrap it up and like that, right? So this was uh, after the project was going on for I don't know what, maybe six weeks, two months, I don't know. I'm I'm fuzzy on those things. Uh, but uh, uh, a couple of graduate student artists who were also doing street art. So this was not the young guy, you know, these were guys that were already developed artists. And, uh, and you know, I, they did their deal. That was it. It was one o'clock in the morning. I took home. Everything was over. Came by the next day and they had put up, come back later in the night put up other pieces, which actually were really fabulous pieces, but they had trashed paint everywhere and made a mess of things. And uh, somewhere in my benefactors on the, I assume it was the benefaction committee, because I don't even know, uh, came out and had it power washed, cleaned all that stuff up. So the project was all in all a, a success. Uh, it had a lot of different kind of things going on during, during the project. 
and that was the end of it. I, you know, everybody was happy with that, and there we go. Uh, back then, the um, the graffiti kind of broke down into different groups. This is 1990. I'm sure it's different now, but at the time, uh, you had a gang type graffiti. Uh, and there's, there's a particular art form where you spread your name as far around as you can. You put them on trains across the country, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you have graffiti that are kind of different kind of patterns and, and ways about it. So you have uh, the gang type, and then you have the graffiti artists. Uh, they don't necessarily want to call themselves artists. They could be called writers, but they do their deal. Uh, this is a more sophisticated art form also starting in New York on those trains and now is uh, uh, what you see out on the uh, graffiti walls out here. Uh, they're fabulous pieces. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's its own art form. Uh, <clears throat> so at the time, those were the ones I'm trying to get to. But you also have the regular graffiti stuff and that was already all along the wall. That was everywhere. Every, every building side, every roll-up door, everything had gang-type graffiti on it. Yeah, these are uh, some of the pieces along the boardwalk. Uh, as we walk along here, this is what they're doing today. The one here in the corner, this looks like train graffiti. Yeah, I mean, so it's that kind of style and look. Uh, this is kind of a nice party piece. Uh, I think this is where uh, a lot of what is art today is happening. is happening right here on the street in Venice. Venice has always been a uh, sort of a vortex for, you know, creative ideas where the bohemian atmosphere is. And you have this sort of nice intellectual community around it as well. This is a nice piece over here. So I think this is, uh, you know, I think you gotta stick with this guy, see what he's got. Yeah, I'm starting to do all the roll downs down here. So I did this, 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 and then those down there. Oh. I'm not done with them. Were you commissioned by the owners? No, I just asked them for permission. It's better than having it all covered up in like, like, crappy graffiti and then the city comes and paints it all this different green. Right. It looks like shit, you know? Right. So we're always adding some color to it. And people take pictures next to it for Instagram and stuff like that, you know, which is cool for me. Do you sign them? No. If I sign them, they'll, they'll cross me out. Go over me. So for right now, they don't know who did it. Yeah. 